today's presentation is Yellow Jack Arrives in Wilmington, the Yellow Fever Epidemic of 1862. So here's Dan Shingleton to start our presentation on Yellow Jack Arrives in Wilmington, the Yellow Fever Epidemic of 1862. I am very pleased to be here, and I thank you for your attendance. I'm particularly pleased to see a number of students here. I must confess that my normal place at these lectures is on the back row, which is where I prefer. I'm especially thankful to be here with my friend Dave Rice, the director of the New Hanover County Health Department in Wilmington. We go back a number of years. I was thinking uh, my first visit to the New Hanover Health Department was in 1973 and have enjoyed going there ever since. And also Eric Cozen, a friend and colleague who is the superintendent of Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington. Now we were uh, saying to Eric today at lunch that his timing is perfect. I have here uh, the April issue of Our State Magazine, uh, which arrived at my home on Friday evening. Uh, it is, uh, in it is a picture of Eric and a multi-page article on Oakdale Cemetery in Wilmington uh, with some beautiful photographs. And by way of introducing Eric, who was not listed on the official program uh, for these events, I want to share a paragraph from this article and then a paragraph uh, from the same article about what brought us here today. Eric Cozen is Oakdale superintendent. He knows Sylvia's story and many others like her, which is a wonderful story that preceded this paragraph. He said, you develop relationships with these people and you can set your watch when they come. They will tell you stories, bring you cookies, and you become part of their family, part of their circle. For the past decade, Cozen 45 has presided over the 100 acres at the end of 15th Street. He has four full-time employees who have mowed, pruned, and clean, cleared and cleaned Oakdale it's every inch. Cozen met his wife here, and he has used his 27 years in the horticultural business and his work as the site manager of Arlington National Cemetery to prune and polish a gem of a cemetery. At least 20,000 people have been buried at Oakdale. So Oakdale is still an active cemetery where they have nearly 100 funerals a year. It has burial space for generations to come. And then it goes on to explain uh, the first person that was buried at Oakdale in 1855, who happened to believe I, uh, Eric was the daughter of the first superintendent of the cemetery. And then this paragraph, which brings us here. On a slight rise of land is the communal burial site of about 400 people who died in Wilmington of yellow fever during a three month span in 1862. Wagons carried dozens of corpse at to Oakdale, killed by what the Wilmington Journal called the Grim Reaper or the grim monster. By the time it had abated, the newspaper declared, General Yellow Jack is no more. He has finally yielded. We must say he died hard, the fate of a sinner. Last year, to help the Wilmington community remember and reflect on what happened there 150 years ago, these two gentlemen conducted walking tours of the cemetery, which you will hear more about shortly, and stood there with tour groups on what is called Yellow Fever Hill. I am always learning something new about this event, so I look forward to hearing Dave and Eric's perspective. I do have several slides. Uh, before we started, I deleted 10, so I only have two. Uh, which I hope will give you some micro perspective of this event. First, uh, the, the picture of the front of Drew Faust's book. 
We are here today, 151 years later, to discuss the suffering and death of hundreds of people who lived in Wilmington in 1862. Surely victims of their time and surely victims of the conditions that were created in Wilmington by the American Civil War. Yes, members of the Republic of Suffering. Thank goodness for Dr. Drew Faust, who happens to be the president of Harvard University, that has in this book expanded the community of suffering to bystanders, folks at home, and hundreds of other people in this case who turn yellow and puke what is called in the literature black vomit, and who had heard those dreaded words, yellow fever. Dr. Faust is a historian who is greatly interested in the American South. Her great interest is the antebellum South and the American Civil War. But I must tell you, as a former faculty member, she has made quite a bit of history herself. She's the first woman president of Harvard. And I, if there are faculty here, I couldn't help but share this. And she is the first president of Harvard University since 1672 that does not have an undergraduate or graduate degree from Harvard. Of special interest to those that are gathered here, she is married to a medical historian, Charles Rosenberg. I must confess I almost shed tears when I first looked at chapter five. She began uh, with a title of chapter five, which is realizing civilians and the work of mourning. The chapter begins with these words. War victimized civilians as well as soldiers and uncounted numbers of non-combatants perished as a result of the conflict. She then goes on to explain what kind of suffering the war brought to what we call civilian population in our country, particularly in the American South. On page 138, there's a commentary on yellow fever in Wilmington, and I quote, in the fall of 1862, nearly 500 cases of yellow fever and malaria in Wilmington, North Carolina, in part local physicians believe because the construction of army breastworks had increased the number of stagnant ponds around the city. I placed this photograph in the presentation to remind me and to remind us of the process of maritime quarantine, which began in our state by enabling legislation passed in the latter part of the 18th century. This photograph in the era points to the quarantine station that was situated in the harbor uh, in the Cape Fear River, which uh, burned uh, in the early part of the 20th century, but the pilings are still there, that served, this station served as a quarantine station from the latter part of the 19th century to the early part of the 20th century. The purpose of the quarantine station and all the laws that, passed, that were passed by the General Assembly was to keep ships with diseased crew and passengers from proceeding up the river into Wilmington. So given all this as somewhat of a contextual background, and since there are a number of public healthers here, I want to summarize briefly some of the things I learned about public health from studying this particular case. If you look at yellow fever in Wilmington in the 19th century, this is what I think you'll find. In 1821, there was a serious epidemic of yellow fever in the town. Please remember that until 1910, Wilmington was the largest city in, or town in North Carolina. It is interesting because between 1921 and, I'm sorry, 1821 and 1862, officials in this town made a concerted effort to protect the town by improving its sanitation and by quarantine methods. This seemed 
to have worked. And the history of the Civil War bears this out. One case example I would point you to is what I would call the capital of yellow fever in the 19th century, New Orleans. In 1861, the first year of the war, the Union Navy blockaded the mouth of the Mississippi River. In 1862, the Union Army captured New Orleans. So the mouth of the, Cape Fear, the Mississippi River was quarantined and the city was cleaned up by Union troops. So there is maritime quarantine and sanitation. And for the first time in the 19th century, for the four years during the war, no yellow fever in New Orleans. Up until that time, there was almost an annual outbreak of yellow fever. But for four years, with using these two methods at the time of, of public health, there were no cases of yellow fever in New Orleans. By the way, there may be another reason. I read somewhere that General Ben Butler told the, his port physician, as long as yellow fever doesn't show up in New Orleans, you'll get paid. The day it shows up here, you, you will not get paid. <coughs> Number two. Between 1821 and 1862, officials in Wilmington made a concerted effort to protect their town with improved sanitation and maritime quarantine. And the next reported major outbreak was in 1862. Three. Because of the conditions created in Wilmington by the Civil War, the efforts that I mentioned regarding sanitation and quarantine were compromised. And therefore, we see the appearance of this terrible scourge. I guess in modern military parlance, or, or we would refer to it as a form of collateral damage. Four. Anytime public health efforts are compromised in any community, there will come suffering and frequently death. Witness recently in our country the tragedy of the New England Compounding Center. Number five, modern war. Remember one of my favorite Civil War writers is Bruce Caton, wrote an insightful essay called The First Modern War referred to the Civil War as the first modern war. Modern war is a major public health issue. The facts are clear. In modern wars, innocent bystanders, non-combatants will be maimed and die much more than combatants in those wars. And finally, ask any student of, American, of the American Civil War, how many casualties were there in the war and almost immediately the response will be 620,000. Then ask the same student, how many non-combatants or civilians? And the look you will see is one of the deer staring in the headlights. In a larger sense, I hope this presentation will raise this issue. Who are the members of the Republic of Suffering? Who belongs? Before I begin my presentation, I need to give a better introduction to Dan Shingleton. I've known Dan Shingleton since I've come to this state in 1997. And those of us in public health very quickly will recognize this man as the public health historian for the state of North Carolina. He has done amazing things. So much so that our, the New Hanover County Board of Health two years ago recognized Dan for his efforts in maintaining and keeping public health history alive and well. If you walk through the hallways of the New Hanover County Health Department, you'll find many historical markers thanks to Dan's donation. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Dan for what he has done for public health. I'll, I'll uh, roast Eric when I complete my session. <laughs> my, present, my part of the presentation is to put a face on the epidemic that occurred 150 years ago last fall in Wilmington. Uh, as you can see at the slide, you can see a picture of Fort Fisher 
and also a picture below that of downtown Wilmington where they were processing pine tar and so forth at, at the port. Uh, in 1862, uh, the Civil War, as you know, was ongoing. Uh, Fort Fisher was under attack. Blockade runners were going in and out of Union barricades to bring supplies to the to Confederate soldiers. Now let's get a little bit of your feeling into this process as well. Do you all, everyone in the room, know exactly where you were on 9-11? Okay. Uh, just a month after that, do you all recall the anthrax scares? How did you all feel? Did you feel threatened? Okay. Same thing was happening in 1862. The war was going on. Yellow fever struck with a vengeance, so much so that the population of between 10 and 11,000 dwindled to 4,000 population within the first couple of weeks of the first case being identified. People were running scared. Physicians were telling their patients and families leave town now. Well, 4,000 remained at that point in time. Of those 4,000, 1,505 became ill with yellow fever, over a fourth. And of those 1,505 reported cases, 654 died. Uh, and that happened between September and the frosts of November in 1862. Now, I have to pause also because uh, the father of public health for the state of North Carolina is a Wilmingtonian, Dr. Thomas Fanning Wood. Dr. Thomas Fanning Wood went back and forth to the legislature many, many times trying to start the public health movement. Do you know how much the, the legislature finally gave him to start the public health movement? A grand sum of $100. And who is on the $100 bill? Anybody know? Benjamin Franklin. And who is a relative of Thomas Fanning Wood? Benjamin Franklin. His father, Robert Barclay Wood, moved from Nantucket, Massachusetts to Wilmington to build Thalian Hall and St. James and a number of beautiful homes in the Wilmington area. Uh, it didn't, the story didn't stop there. Dr. Wood's son, Edward Jenner Wood, also became a, fishin, a physician. And uh, he was... I've been told, was being considered for a Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, uh, findings of um, um, pellagra, uh, the connection of pellagra. Dr. Thomas Fanning Wood was a Confederate surgeon on the front lines of ma every major battle of the war between the states. He was stationed at Confederate Hospital No. 4 uh, when yellow fever occurred. Um, not only that, he was the organizer and treasurer of the State Board of Health. Not only that, he founded the North Carolina Medical Journal. And then on top of that, as Eric can testify, he was a botanist. And uh, he, was very, he was an expert in, in determining and wrote a book on Wilmington flora. Another gentleman that I need to speak of is Dr. Solomon Sampson Sashwell. Now, whose mother would name their son for wisdom and strength. Well, sometimes when you name a child, they turn out that way. And Dr. Satchwell did so. He was also a Confederate surgeon, and he was head of the Confederate Hospital in Wilson. He was also the founder of the State Medical Society. He was the first president of the State Board of Health. I'm not so sure this was one of his accomplishments, but he helped uh, form Pender County from New Hanover County. At the time, he was a New Hanover County, and he, uh, uh, he became uh, Pender County. He was known as an orator, so he could convince anybody of anything. An orator. It's my West Virginia twine. It doesn't mix sometimes with the Southern drawl. Uh, the next report is a very, uh, it's an amazing report. It's found, found in the New York Medical Journal, Volume 9, pages 478 through 496 in 1867. Uh, it was written by William T. Ragg, Dr. Ragg of Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Ragg was a Confederate surgeon stationed in Charleston, South Carolina when 
the epidemic of yellow fever struck so hard that there were men, not many physicians remaining. So the Confederates, because of the concerns of losing Fort Fisher in the stronghold of the Confederates in the Wilmington area, asked him to go see what the situation was. And this was re his report of the situation. Uh, what was the origin of yellow fever? Well, there was an ongoing de debate between Dr. Ragg and Dr. William George Thomas, a local physician. There were three theories. One was it was imported uh, from the blockade runner Kate that came from Nassau in the Bahamas. The second uh, theory was uh, the cases of yellow, yellow fever occurred in Wilmington before uh, Kate arrived, which I might think, well, maybe there might have been another blockade runner that brought yellow fever earlier. Uh, and then I always like the third theory. It's the conspiracy theory. The damn Yankees loaded up Cape, moved her up the Cape Fear River. Bioterrorism, if you will. These are the environmental concerns that Dr. Ragg wrote in his report. So Dan was talking about Wilmington got cleaned up until the war, who had de deteriorated very rapidly. When he arrived at when he arrived, arrived into town at 2 a.m., uh, there was a dark canopy of fires from tar and rosin and lightwood that were being burned in barrels in everybody's backyard. They thought that would help uh, stop the yellow fever. There were disagreeable odors from piles of offal, which is uh, uh, trimmings from butchered animals. There was neglect of scavengering due to military works, garbage collectors, if you will. All available men were not available to pick up the garbage anymore. They were brought into the military. Uh, there was a, the, the topography of Wilmington was that there was a series of dunes. The soil was sea sand. Uh, the manures were enriched, uh, enriched for gardening. The groundwater was too close to the surface. The rainy season produced many ponds. Moist climate and hot temperatures were there. Cellars were flooded. Uh, refuge, as I said, was accumulated everywhere. Hotels, grocery stores, markets, and county contributions were all closed. And late summer heavy rains caused a lot of ponding. This is the 1862 epicurve of yellow fever in our community. Uh, you probably can't see this from the back, but the most cases per week happened the week of October the 17th, where 431 people became ill. And logically, the following week was the highest number of deaths per week, 111 that week. So Oakdale Cemetery was very busy the week of October the 24th. Putting a face on yellow fever there were what I call martyrs of yellow fever that remained at their post in Wilmington. Dr. James Henderson Dixon, he was quite an interesting man. Uh, he was a student at uh, UNC Chapel Hill at the ripe old age of 13. He graduated there in, at the age of 17, and he came back and gave UNC's commencement speech in 1853. He received his medical degree from Columbia College at 21 years of age. He was one of the most public-spirited people in Wilmington. He was president of the North Carolina Medical Society in 1854, and he was the one that diagnosed the first five cases of yellow fever. This is a quote from Dr. Dixon. It says, Tuesday the 9th, I have seen five cases. Of these, two have died. One is discharged as a convalescent, and two are still under treatment with doubtful prospects. Dr. Dixon died three weeks later on September the 28th. The second martyr I want to bring your attention to is Reverend John Lamb Pritchett. Reverend Pritchett graduated from Wake Forest in 1843. He was ordained at the First Baptist Church in Danville, Virginia. He was pastor of the Front Street Baptist Church in Wilmington, in 1856, which became First Baptist Church of Wilmington. Uh, he was one of three clergy who remained with their congregations, uh, Dr. Pritch, or Reverend Pritchett, Dr. Robert Drain from St. James Episcopal, 
and, and Father Thomas Murphy. Here is a quote from Reverend Pritchett. Saturday I was sent for to see a man with the fever. I asked Dr. Dixon what he thought I ought to do. Well, he said, I reckon you will have to do as I do. It's like war. We must take our chances. You will have to go and see many during their illness. It rained torrents during the day, and on Sunday it continued raining all day until sunset it cleared. I preached to a very few in the morning. Also, Dr. Robert Brent Drain. He was a rector, rector at St. James Episcopal uh, from 1836. He left for a short while and came back. Uh, he, was, he was educated at, Har at Harvard. And here's a quote from Dr. Drain. In 1862, yellow fever raged through Wilmington, completely disrupting social and business activity. Food, medical supplies, and even coffins could be scarcely found. While many left the city, the St. James Rector, Dr. Drain, stayed and ministered until he too succumbed to the fever in 18, on October the 14th, 1862. In St. James Parish, you will find a flag. It's the yellow fever flag. In addition, you'll find the 1865 Union Hospital flag when the Union soldiers took over St. James and made it a hospital. But here's what the 1862 flag represents. You may be able to see the horse. This is the terrible pestilence combined with the horrors of war is represented by a horseman of the apocalypse racing across a field of yellow, dated 1862. You already heard this quote, so I won't read it again, but James Fulton was the proprietor of the Wilmington Journal. John Dawson, he was a magistrate of police. He was mayor of, 18, mayor of Wilmington in 1862, and he remained as mayor through the war and up until 1878. So he must have been a likable fellow to survive uh, the war. Said it to the Charleston Courier, he wrote, the yellow fever epidemic is here increasing rapidly, and our physicians are nearly, ex nearly exhausted. Some of them are already sick. As a result of Dawson's plea, Help started arriving from Charleston and the military, including Dr. Rag. Phineas W. Fanning. Uh, he was secretary of the Sanitary Committee in Wilmington, and he was the only member to remain uh, to take care of many things while people evacuated the town. Here's his quote. It says, through the terrible epidemic of 1862, he stood shoulder to shoulder with members of a small committee, self-constituted, who braved the perils of the fearful scourge, and few of whom survived to procure substance for the destitute who could not flee, to nurse the sick, to bury the dead, and to protect the deserted property of the citizens. And, to, and at the close of the war, he found himself an old man as poor and destitute as any of those whom he had labored and suffered through that terrible four years of war and pestilence. <clears throat> James Sprunt. James Sprunt was, you may have heard, James Sprunt Community College. Uh, James Sprunt also is the author of Chronicles of the Cape Fear River from 1660 to 1916. Uh, he was an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a historian. And here's his quote, and it's somewhat humorous, I believe. My father was informed promptly of, our, of this by our physician, Dr. James H. Dixon, who advised him to remove his family at once to the country. As my father had seen so much of this terrible scourge in the West Indies and in South America, he recognized the gravity of the situation and sent us all to Duplin County, where he had relatives. Before we left, a ludicrous incident occurred which has stuck in my memory. One of my brothers, having kept to his room from indisposition, was at once the object of much solicitude. My father, being a bit of a medico, directed the boy to stick out his tongue, which he did with evident reluctance. 
to the horror of my father, who declared that he had symptoms of yellow fever. The shamefaced confession that the patient had secretly been chewing tobacco, which had caused his sickness, relieved the situation and calmed our fears. Congressman John Dillard Bellamy. This is his quote. Uh, if any of you have been to Wilmington, you know a beautiful mansion called the Bellamy Mansion. This is where he lived. And from Bellamy Mansion, it is just 10 blocks up market and what, three blocks to, to Oakdale, five box, blocks to Oakdale Cemetery. Here's what he recollects. He says, I recollect, recollect well, having stood in our home on Market and Fifth Streets, watching wagon loads of corpses go by to Oakdale Cemetery. Of those who had died from that malignant disease. Well, thanks to a couple decades later, uh, Dr. Walter Reed discovered the key to the vaccine that would protect against yellow fever, but not only until two decades after the epidemic had struck in uh, Wilmington. Very interesting painting uh, called Conquerors of Yellow Fever by Dean Cornwell is uh, from the Wyeth Athurst Pharmaceutical Collection called Pioneers of American Medicine. The painting uh, is an allegorical depiction of one of the great moments in medical history. With Walter Reed, Carlos Finley looking on, Jesse Lazier, who died a month later as a result of self-experimentation, is shown inoculating James Carroll with the infected mosquito. The good news is the last case of yellow fever in the United States was in July of 1996. It was a 45-year-old 40, resident of Tennessee planning a trip to Brazil for a fishing trip along the Amazon. He elected not to acquire the recommended immunization and as a result died of the disease. And this was the first documented imported case since 1924. Now Eric, Eric, uh, when we first started putting together our yellow fever tours, Eric asked if I would do this for the, with him for the, uh, the, the uh, cemetery, and I said, most certainly. It is a public health issue that we can go back in time and connect with the past so we won't repeat the present. And at that, uh, at that restaurant, I recognized that I had to very quickly raise my A game to my A plus game, because Eric is phenomenal with his understanding of history and his love of Oakdale Cemetery. And, Friend, it's your turn. Um, I definitely, um, my hat's off to these two gentlemen here. They are uh, way far uh, more advanced in regards to a lot of the history, especially uh, uh, yellow fever, public health, etc. cetera. Um, my hat's definitely off to them, um, especially with Dave here, um, as he had just mentioned. It was something that we had started, um, actually I had in my mind a couple years ago. I've now been superintendent to Oakdale Cemetery for almost 11 years now. And I look at the cemetery um, going through milestones. Um, we went through a milestone when I was first there. Uh, I started in 2002, uh, but unfortunately I was there so quickly that uh, I didn't really have much time to uh, do something that was going to be um, quintessential for the cemetery. So I had to kind of push it back about three or four uh, years after that. Um, well, basically, the cemetery was started in 1852. And um, it was really started as uh, pretty much almost kind of the same ordeal here. It was a public cry um, from a lot of the citizens of Wilmington. And the public cry really came to be that um, a lot of people that were being buried prior to Oakdale's existence were actually being done in city church graveyards. Um, these were typically small plots of land that were behind a lot of the city churches. I think there was even a small, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, central location where there was actually a graveyard within the, the town limits, but it was very small to begin with. And there had to be some place to be um, sufficient for the population. And a lot of the cities like Wilmington uh, that were running up and down the eastern seaboard um, were falling into these same um, ordeals where their populations were, were expanding uh, almost tenfold from the immigration from the old world into the new world. So. Um, what occurred was with a lot of these cities that they had to have a, a formal place for the burial of the dead. And so that's where cemeteries really became born. Um, it was a very new uh, thought and idea that was actually coming from the old world because they were facing it as well with a lot of the crowded cities that was running out of space. And 
the creation of cemeteries just kind of seemed fit. But it also came to the same effect that they were very scared that um, a lot of these uh, diseases and what people were dying from would actually be transferred from the dead to the living. And a lot of these places where these people were being buried were obviously within our, our close communal locations, being in the hearts of the city. So you were pretty much walking by it every day, going to church, whatever it may be. These locations were fairly right there, evident right there in front of us. So the born of cemeteries were to be done on the outskirts of town. And so they would uh, typically ch uh, choose to purchase large tracts of land if they were available. Um, Oakdale Cemetery was purchased originally at 65 acres for $1,100 in, in 1852. So um, they were pretty much about the, we're still trying to figure out what number they actually were, but it was right around about the 13th or 14th cemetery that was being created in the United States. The first one being Mount Auburn Cemetery, which was up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that was actually uh, formalized uh, some 20 years earlier in 1832. And again, <clears throat> it was done on the outskirts of town. Um, but it was close enough that it was not uh, f too far of a, a ride or a travel. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the cemetery has first started out with 65 acres, and that is pretty much what we see here uh, within the map. Um, they first started off in an alphabetical sequence uh, where they started off with section A, B, C, D, E, and F. And as we see in the kind of the middle of the cemetery, you'll see a very large open square that doesn't have any other additional squares. And that location is actually known as what they call the public grounds. Um, the public grounds was the area for people who uh, may not have had um, enough funding to purchase a family lot, um, or they were indigents that were passing through. Um, but it was a place that was just kind of set aside because when the cemetery became formalized, um, the commissioners at the time for Wilmington I went ahead and passed an ordinance to no longer allow any future burials to be taken place within these city church graveyards and so forth. So the only place of burial to be done was at Oakdale Cemetery. So with this place being set aside, it was kind of on the, the what I call the back 40 of the cemetery during the time frame. It really wasn't in the hustle and bustle of the cemetery. It was just kind of done on the back uh, field that they had. And it basically encompasses close to about one and a half acres. Um, when Yellow fever came to this town. It was still still very early in the time frame of Oakdale. Uh, Oakdale first took its burial in 1855, as, as um, Dave had mentioned, and some seven years later we get afflicted in 1862 with this major epidemic that, that took place. I don't think anybody saw this, this wave coming um, to Oakdale, but as soon as it came, it became very evident um, that you know, people really needed to kind of heed the warnings of you know, the doctors and so forth that were pretty much telling you to get out of town. The location that um, you know, it does, it has been listed as the yellow fever area. That was the location that was, that was utilized during this time frame. And, um, in 1862, they started doing the burials. Um, I think the first reported case was somewhere close to in, in August. Um, still a little bit of question in regards to when that was, or was it actually September? Well, I think it was, think it was September. September was the first reported case um, that took place. Even I have conflicting things, because when I've been at the cemetery, I've been told certain things, and I'm like, okay, I've got to uh, be able to verify some of the stuff. And David and Dan here have been very, very kind to um, correct me when I need to be corrected. So. Um, but during that time frame, I mean, they, these people really never saw what was coming. And even the graph that David had shown, um, where we see the, the epic curve really start to occur in, in October, um, it was tremendous. I mean, you're really bringing in uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 bodies a day. Um, the gentleman who first started out there at the cemetery, um, his name was Charles Quigley. And unfortunately, right during the midst of that epic curve, um, he lost his life for yellow fever as well. And he was actually buried within this location um, which is known as what we call Yellow Fever Hill. Um, shortly after uh, the epidemic had ended, um, and actually the Civil War had ended, um, they decided to uh, go ahead and remove uh, Mr. Quigley and place him in a more formidable spot considering he was the first superintendent there. Some of the stories that I've been told, um, which I have yet to verify, is that it pretty much wiped out his entire family. Um, this location in the Yellow Fever uh, location is People had told me that first it was a mass burial ground and their descriptions to me were that there were these large pits that were dug and the bodies were, were put into them and then covered up. And to me, you know, nowadays we kind of think of, um, I guess it was Havana that had the, um, not Havana, but Haiti that had the, the uh, earthquake that was there. Same type of ordeal. But 
what happened was that when I came to the cemetery, the only piece of equipment that we had there was an IBM II Selectric typewriter. And it was my job to go ahead and computerize these records. Now, we wasn't mentioned that there were close to 20,000 people that were interred there. Well, imagine typing in 20,000 people's names. And then on top of that, the other lot cards, which each one of these squares that you see here are indicated by a particular lot. And within those lots, there's anywhere from 12 to 24 people that are buried in there. So we had to be able to combine all of this information together. Well, as I, I was typing this in with my secretary, uh, which took us about, uh, about 14 months to complete, I soon started to figure out that in this yellow fever area that these mass burial grounds were not evident. And so I decided to go back to my old school ways and get out the graph paper and started putting in squares and dots where these people were being buried. And I soon realized that there was a little bit of a mass chaos but a method to their actual burials. And when they were burying people, they were burying three or four here, three or four here, four or five over here. And in a particular family, if a wife had passed and some three days later the husband had passed, they would reopen that grave where the wife was passed and bury them on top of each other. And soon realized that there were sometimes entire families in a single grave space being sometimes even four deep. So I started to realize that this was something that, you know, people were telling me that these were a mass burial group. Yes, the entire area is as a whole, but when it came to be the actual burials that took place, um, being even with the epic curve, you're having you know 10 or 15 a day that were being done, and including the superintendent at the time frame, unfortunately had uh, had fallen ill to the disease and dies. Um, even when he dies, then what happens? Now you have the gentleman who was in charge of the cemetery. Someone's got to step forward. So what was told to me is that you know Mr. Fanning, who was the sanitary commissioner, sanitary commissioner he stepped up to the plate. And he was the one at the point in time that was looking over the cemetery and the burial methods that were being taken place. Someone had to do it. And I don't really know exactly when the time frame was when they actually hired um, the second superintendent who came in, but I'm sure it wasn't too soon after the effect that they had actually uh, found this other gentleman. And he was fairly young as well. I think he started out there when he was um, 26 years old, and he ended up working there for 54 years. So um, he stayed there for quite some time. But... The cemetery here was, um, it started out, uh, like I said, on this lower portion, as you see with a lot of the, um, uh, the more curved linear uh, style um, of the plots that were laid out because it was done as a rural garden cemetery. It was a place that was supposed to be of, of beauty, um, to be matched in with nature. It was an antebellum uh, type scenario with a lot of the, the monuments that could even tower even higher than the ceiling that's in this room here. So, uh, but when I arrived out to the cemetery, oops, sensitive. When I arrived out to the cemetery, this plaque had actually just been placed there. Um, but unfortunately, the grounds uh, that were there were particularly not in the greatest fashion. It was a little bit overgrown. Um, and in this particular location, there's close to about 1,700 people that are buried there. Uh, out of the 1,700 people that are actually buried there, there's only about probably 15 markers. Um, one of the things that was done uh, just prior to my arrival there was this plaque that was placed up there for the Yellow Fever Mound. Uh, most people, that's what they were able to see, uh, as well as the overgrowth that was there. Um, I had spent probably the past 10 years cleaning up the cemetery because it definitely, as, as Dan had mentioned within the article um, that just came out, um, that you know I've been polishing up the cemetery to be a gem. And this was one of the first places that I started off with because it was easy. It was a, it was a nice big field um, and kind of clean up some of the undergrowth. But I started to figure out this, like, well, all these people had died there. There's about 400 people that died um, that are actually buried within this particular location in the Yellow Fever area. And there's not but one person, I think there's only one marker there that actually marks the grave of someone um, buried with Yellow Fever. All the other 398 or so that are buried there don't have anything. And so I took it upon myself with an Eagle Scout project to go ahead and start planting daffodils. It was my way of giving back to... Um, these folks. And I kind of did it undercover. I really didn't tell anybody about it, so I was kind of asking for forgiveness later. Um, but when it came springtime the next year, because we planted, I think the first time around, we planted close to about 4,000 daffodil bulbs over there. And this place is visited daily by a lot of people. Um, springtime, you can pretty much ramp those numbers up tenfold because people come in there for the springtime. But when they saw this big splotch of yellow, um, I had more people calling, stopping in the office, saying, what in the world is going on out here? And I told them 
uh, what I did and why I did it. They just thought it was the most tremendous thing that, that had ever been done because they had been seeing the cleanup kind of happen slowly, but all of a sudden with this uh, array of daffodil bulbs, um, it started coming and coming. So year after year, I've planted probably close to about three or four, 5,000 more, uh, close to about 10,000 cents. Unfortunately, the recent droughts um, have kind of affected a little bit of the growth out there, but I am uh, slated to probably plant another three or 4,000 this year to kind of keep it going. So, um, but as you may read in the magazine, that cemetery was really developed for families, and it was a place for people to come, um, unfortunately grieve for what it is, but it's also to tell stories. It's to tell stories about the families, families that have come, families that have been lost. Um, but over the years, I've been finding people come out there during Easter time frame, or sometimes earlier, and taking actual just pictures um, with girls in their Easter suits or Easter dresses and so forth. So it's kind of turned out to be a, a wonderful thing. As David mentioned earlier, um, we do a lot of tours out in the cemetery. Um, I've been doing tours at the cemetery now for probably six or seven years. And when I asked Dave to do this, I don't think I got past the sentence before he said yes. Uh, not a problem. Uh, then we got Dan on board to, uh, to kind of help us out with some of the uh, historical aspects of it. But uh, uh, Dave's been a trooper all along. He started out, we kind of did this thing. It was, a, it was the sesquicentennial of the yellow fever epidemic that took place. And we did this last year um, in 2012. And it really kind of took a, uh, a hold of its own. And, and we started off in August when kind of the, the, the fever was going to start ready to beginning, and it was just god-awful hot. I mean, it was, had to have been 90-plus degrees, but we still had a very good crowd that came out. But when it came October time frame, we couldn't count all the people that came out for this tour. We had close to what we were able to count was close to about 80-some uh, people that came out um, for this particular tour. And it was very well done. We had a wonderful day out there, um, and we look forward to doing a few more tours um, during this time frame, which you can see some of the pictures that... Uh, that are there, and we talked about uh, you know Reverend Pritchard and, and Dr. Dixon and and uh, some of the other uh, quintessential places that are within Oakdale. So it was uh, it turned out to be a good thing. We're we're looking forward to do it again. I think this year is on April August twentieth um, of this year. So if you're in Wilmington, um, you're more than welcome to uh, to come and partake within that. If you forget about it, we do have a website at oakdalecemetery.org. It has a lot of that information that's on there. So. Um, I'm most thankful to be here and be able to provide some of you this information and, and definitely be a part of this panel with these uh, fine gentlemen here. So, thank you. We'll now do a question and answer session. Uh, before I do so, uh, we've got some uh, refreshments at the back you're welcome to uh, have. Also, uh, we, we asked you to sign in. That's the way we get, in effect, uh, that's your, uh, your bill for attending. <laughs> that's, and I'm going to ask that everybody first hold up their hand and I'll bring the mic to you. That allows us to get both the question and the answer on the tape. So are there any questions? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, burial procedures back then. I assume that uh, they, they mentioned there that they had trouble with coffins. Um, there were, was there embalming, any type of embalming that went on? Was there, uh, I know, I, guess, I assume they did not have vaults at that time. So were these, when you mentioned the, the mass area, were these uh, folks that were buried families that were buried together, were they in a coffin typically or not? Were they wrapped? Was there any type of preparation of the bodies? Was that a concern, a public health concern at that time? I can't answer on the uh, actual preparation of the bodies. Maybe one of these two gentlemen here could chime in with that. Uh, but for the actual uh, burials of them, uh, most of them were probably buried in a pine box of some sort, some type of container. Um, they would not uh, be typically buried in, in a vault of what we're used to today. That's kind of something that's really started off since probably about the 1950s. Um, but to be honest with you that if you were able to purchase one of the cemetery lots within Oakdale, um, some of the families were able to construct their own vaults. And they would actually construct um, sometimes brick vaults. Um, you'll find even brick vaults in old cemeteries, even church graveyards. You'll find a lot of them that are raised up, sometimes domed. 
uh, but typically they were they were usually constructed of whatever um, uh, resources were available um, at the area. Like if they were making a lot of brick, there's a lot of brick within Wilmington, so um, a lot of brick was utilized. Um, ballast stones were also utilized as well um, because of the shipping. Um, so the ballast were were able to be there to kind of help the uh, the ship kind of stay level. And so ballast stones were offloaded and loaded numerous times. Some of the walls within Oakdale are made of, of ballast stones, so there was, there was a, a large commodity of those items that were uh, available as well. But for typical vaults, um, not in that particular area would have been done. Um, probably if, if they were able to afford a pine box. I think barrel at the time for an adult was $5. And I'm um, not sure. I think that kind of included um, the actual casket itself, but that would have been done through um, the funeral home, or sometimes there were cabinet makers, but there were sometimes one of the two as well. But for the embalming purpose, I'm going to point to one of these two gentlemen here. Uh, Dr. Faust uh, addresses embalming during the Civil War years, but I have never seen a reference to victims of yellow fever being embalmed. The references I've seen is that uh, wagons would come by daily with, with bodies on them and they were taken out to Oakdale and buried. So I, I would guess that these people were not embalmed. Well, plus the blockade, supplies were yes. through, so yes. the embalmed supplies would have been, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> with the blockade being on, um, Embalming supplies would have been pretty sparse. And uh, it was, I think, a relatively new thing anyway, wasn't it? In the 1860s, it was like if you had the money, uh, but you know, 1862 Confederacy, yeah. was pretty tight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, usually, these crises spark some kind of response, a public health health response. Did that happen uh, here in Wilmington during the war, or was the war uh, an obstacle to make, making such a response? Uh, Go ahead. I uh, can tell you that after 1821 and the experience in Wilmington with yellow fever for for many years, people got very seriously about sanitation and quarantine, et cetera. And I've seen numerous references that after this event, uh, the people in Wilmington re rededicated themselves to cleaning up the town and doing something about uh, yellow fever. And in fact, uh, Dave and I were talking about it at lunch. I, uh, to my knowledge, there didn't appear another yellow fever epidemic in Wilmington after this period of time. So yes, it, it, was, it, it, it created an environment where people took what was happening seriously and, and rededicated themselves to public health uh, efforts which not only ha happens in uh, when crises uh, face us these days of the public health nature, we see the same things happening over and over again. Quite, quite amazing that uh, uh, we, we create these infrastructures of public health that are very work extremely well and then through neglect and, and so forth uh, don't pay attention and all of a sudden we're having problems again and we have to re reinvent the wheel and start over again or start efforts again. So uh, what's it George Santiano said, people that don't remember the past are condemned to relive it and for some reason or another uh, uh, human beings have strange and sometimes short memories. And if I could follow up on that. Uh, I believe there was a lot done once the war ended, at least from the northern perspective it ended. I know after I had moved to, to Wilmington, I was told the war still hadn't ended. So, But in 1867, a Union general was named general health officer over Wilmington. In 1875, just about a decade later, the first superintendent of health was, was formed. Uh, New Hanover County Board of Health is the first Board of Health in the state of North Carolina was formed in 1879, and there have been 22 superintendents of health, health officers, or health directors in place since that time. Uh, yes, make one other comment? I should uh, share with you that 
uh, as Dave has referenced, uh, Wilmington was eventually occupied by Union soldiers. Uh, and when Union soldiers left uh, Wilmington, there was a terrible smallpox epidemic there, which required the creation of a smallpox hospital. Uh, before that, I should mention this uh, edition of the North Carolina Historical Review in 1864. It was a terrible small, uh, yellow fever epidemic in Newburn that took the lives of almost 300 people. Uh, Newburn at that time was occupied by the Union Army. It was a terrible experience. So two years after this, somewhat north of Wilmington, there was a terrible yellow fever epidemic in Newburn. And there's a long article in this, if you'd like to look at it or a reference uh, in this. In fact, I think the picture of the A.D.'s Egypti, AD's Egypti that's on the advertisement came from the front of this uh, historical review. Uh, I believe the, the Latin word for I, I believe the word mosquito comes from the Latin word meaning the little flies. And you think about uh, little flies and yellow fever and also malaria, which is a, continues to be a serious problem in the, in the world we live in. Uh, thank you for being here. I had a question about the uh, role of the uh, burial with respect to race, uh, given this was the Civil War and then also with respect to being Union versus con Confederate soldiers. And if you could just comment on how uh, this was addressed uh, with burial from Yellow Yel Yel Um I guess prior to the Civil War, uh, there were segregated cemeteries. Um, again, as I had mentioned, uh, that you know cemeteries kind of came born after a uh, um, I guess a public ply for you know having a, a communal location. Um, Oakdale was the communal location um, for Caucasian. Uh, the cemetery that borders our property, uh, which is known as Pine Forest Cemetery, was typically for the for the black population that was there. Um, that's pretty much how it you know took place, and I don't think that a lot of the the numbers that are probably uh, have been listed. Uh, regarding the uh, cases reported um, or even the deaths that were reported really kind of even falls into the pl black population that was there because Wilmington um, had a very large black population that was there and I don't think a lot of those numbers reflect um, that location. There's even still question in regards to the actual beginning of this cemetery um, being known as Pine Forest Cemetery. They're pretty much slated as being 1860 um, because you know when that time frame came when the uh, town commissioners pretty much disallowed any other future burials to take place within the town limits. The town at that point was pretty much only up to about um, about 8th, 9th, 10th Street, depending on how far out the houses were. Oakdale Cemetery and Pine Forest Cemetery are out near 15th and 16th Street. So it's just kind of, I don't want to say it's out in the sticks or out in the boonies, but it was the location that was chosen um, that was there. And if you go there in today's time frame, um, Oakdale Cemetery actually shares borders with three other cemeteries, not only Pine Forest Cemetery, but Bellevue Cemetery, which was created um, some 20 years later in 1870s. And then on the other side is another um, uh, predominantly black cemetery known as Calvary Cemetery, which goes on the other border um, of the cemetery. And then really kind of not really attached to our uh, property, but it's, I pretty much consider it as such because it's across the street from Bellevue Cemetery is, is another Jewish cemetery that was created. So. Um, and then we also have the uh, National Cemetery that was created some two blocks down. Now, getting into the Confederate and Union deal, um, not to, how long were you here for? Um, as you may read within that article, um, it is how I met my wife. And it's involved with a Union soldier. And when the Unions came and, and occupied Wilmington, um, there were a lot of uh, prisoner war exchanges that took place, and um, my wife's great great uncle was one of these um, uh, prisoners of war that was exchanged in Wilmington, and burials still took place. And so the burials of these Union soldiers that were that were coming from um, other places being exchanged, or actually were, were within the town, or even died of as a result of wounds and so forth, were actually buried at Oakdale. Um, it wasn't until uh, shortly after the war in 1867, uh, 1868 time frame, well, it was actually 66, but it goes into 67, that national cemeteries were created. 
um, for the burial of Union soldiers. And so the, for Oakdale's case, the federal government attempted to purchase that tract of land where there were um, 1,037 Union soldiers that were buried um, in that cemetery. And the uh, owners or the board of directors at the time of, um, decided to put a very high price tag on that particular plot of land. And so the federal government said, no, we're not going to pay that. And they decided to go down the street somewhere else and sequester that land. And then uh, they removed um, all of these Union soldiers that were there. Uh, the Confederates that were buried were as close to about 366 um, within that location as well. Uh, they were later removed uh, in another portion of the cemetery um, where we have, um, that was kind of centrally located, which is Confederate, a burial of Confederate dead that was there. So um, hopefully that answers your question. I've got a question. Since you've talked about a lot of people leaving Wilmington, presumably most of them were people with, uh, with a lot of money. Um, did any of the of those people bring yellow fever since it hadn't been, you know where it hadn't yet been diagnosed with them they had it but they but nobody knew it yet did it, did it, they bring a yellow fever epidemic to any place else not that's reported that I'm aware of but I'm sure that was probably the case my records might indicate that um, because Prior to, I guess it was the health department that was created in 1913. What was uh, 1879? But it was consolidated in 1913. Okay. City. There County. was there was a time frame because the cemetery was actually the the keeper of vital statistics, and all of our records would have indicated you know what your cause of death was, where you died, um, and so forth, and where you were buried within the cemetery. So that's a good question, which I'm actually go back and look at because some of these folks could have died like in Columbus County and were brought to the family plot. Uh, to be buried, and, the, and it will show the cause of death. So that's a good question. I like that. I'm a, whenever I hear about epidemics and such, I always wonder about you know people fleeing mm -hmm. it and then carrying often, it, it, it and carrying it. Mm -hmm. And often, mm -hmm. I mean, you can often trace that through history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that that brings uh, to mind quarantine. You several of you mentioned uh, quarantine. So can anybody speak to that? In, in what regard? Were some of the people quarantined <coughs> through this, and where would they have been quarantined? You mean people in Wilmington being quarantined? Mm -hmm. That had the disease? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, to go back to Melissa's observation, uh, I've learned never to say never. How, however, uh, I. I'm sure sporadically that people who left Wilmington carried a disease elsewhere, but the, the, Wilmington became essentially a ghost town, and then no one was there to enforce any sort of quarantine, et cetera. Incidentally, it is a, quarantine is an interesting word, and I'll hush. Uh, I think this is the last uh, days of, uh, in terms of the Christian year of uh, Lent. Uh, quarantine is traceable, maritime quarantine is traceable back to Venice in bubonic plague uh, years. And when uh, the ports uh, who were trying to prevent people from bubonic plague, or black death from coming into town, decided they, they could see no germ theory but decided there was a relationship between a ship arriving in harbor and people getting sick. So they created what is called in the literature a maritime quarantine, but then they thought about, well, how long should we quarantine a ship that has sick sailors or, or passengers on board? And they looked and looked and looked for a number and found a very popular number in the scriptures, 40. So 40 days of Lent, 40 days with Jesus in the wilderness. So the English word quarantine comes from an Italian word meaning 40.